So uh, a little bit about me, I, I don't get out much. Uh, I, I tend to stay in my home, so I should probably tell you a little bit about what I do. Here are three artifacts from, uh, from my early history. Uh, the first thing at the top is a, is, a t is a cassette tape from the early 80s where I interviewed my sister's stuffed animals. Uh, I just, the, the concept of, a to, of being a talk show host always kind of interested me right out, like just from a very, you know, from being very young, like Johnny Carson had a huge impact on me. Uh, talk radio in the Chicagoland area, which is where I'm from, had a huge impact on me. Uh, that thing next to it is a Hammerland HQ-120 general coverage receiver uh, from the Korean War era, I believe. It's got a couple six V6s in it if you wanted to build a guitar amp. Um, uh, I actually cooked toast in it once, because you can. And uh, that thing on the bottom is my very first computer, an Atari 400. It was already kind of out of date by the time I got it, but I, I certainly got my licks in on that machine. And that led me to three things. One is being a sysadmin administrator. This is an IBM 3B1. This is actually a computer I had once upon a time and did work on. Um, funny thing is, uh, I was at a Seattle Sounders game recently, uh, talking with a friend of mine who's a touring musician, and we were talking music, and he's like, hey, are you a musician? I said, no, no, it's kind of weird, my family is musical, but I, uh, I stepped away, I had to have a talk with my, my, with my father and say, no, father, I will not play the bass guitar, I'm going to follow the calling of my heart and become a systems administrator. <laughs> and then the guy looks at me and he goes, is it being a sysadmin basically the bass player of IT? <laughs> yes. I'm getting a drink. The next thing I do is uh, Camp Quest Northwest. It's a science and skepticism camp for kids in, uh, in Seattle, or in the, in the Washington area. Uh, we get people from Oregon to Alaska and Montana and Canada. Uh, this was this year's outings. We made, uh, I had the kids make, uh, Jewel Thieves, we fabricated about 150 Jewel Thief kits and had them put together and they actually had to spin their own center tap transformers because I'm starting a conspiracy to make guitar amps cheaper. Uh, and then there's my ham shack up there. Uh, that was the antenna I was going to bring but it looked copper so it got taken. And then the last thing that I did was I, I actually was a syndicated talk show host for a little under a decade, mildly syndicated with the show called Ask an Atheist with Sam Mulvey, the subject of which is not germane to this talk at all, but it is a thing that I did. The thing about these three things is that they don't really interop that well together. They don't work together. It's like I have these three silos of things that I love to do, the things that define me. Now, with all this stuff, you think probably my favorite movie growing up was uh, Pump Up the Volume, right? Kid in school, ham radio, talking about things. but. Why would I listen to some punk kid in school talking about how the food is bad when you've got it all on UHF? This was my movie. <laughs> this was the movie that really kind of just grabbed me as a kid. And as a result, even when I was in junior high, I was writing up plans in my notebook for a shortwave radio station that would play weird music and weird stuff. Because I wanted to run, and I knew it would never make any money, and I wanted to run a failing radio station. Because a failing radio station, you don't have to worry about like whether or not you're playing adult contemporary music, or what percentage of your stuff is in the t Billboard 500, or whatever. You can just do what you want because the money is gonna end soon anyway. But I found something pretty close in community radio. Because a community radio station, especially an LPFM, is a nonprofit. It can't make money. So the money never comes into the first place. That frees you up a little bit. Works pretty well. So uh, KTQ ALP 95.3 FM in Tacoma is uh, LPFM radio station. So let's talk about what LPFM is for a little bit. This is what the FCC has to say about the LPFM service. Now, usually when I use this slide, it's to scare people, but I imagine this room could actually pretty much read that and get it. But I usually breeze over this. The thing is, I do some engineering stuff. I understand broadcasting, but to file with the FCC, they have a lingo and terms of art all their own. You have to like hire 
special engineering elves to file documentation with the FCC. It's, uh, uh, it's something I'm learning, but I am, I've not had something accepted yet without comment, so <laughs> I'm working on that. But the idea is basically 100 watts or less is what they say. Now, what they actually want is a 60 dBU, or more to the point, uh, in terms that I understand a little bit better, one millivolt per meter field strength at a five kilometer contour. So we're talking real small. Um, Non-commercial, so like our organization is a 501c3, most LPFMs are. Uh, you can't make money, you can't run advertising. Uh, think like an NPR station, and you're not far away from what an L how an LPFM has to operate. Um, and the thing is, you can't just go to the FCC and say, one LPFM license, please. They have specific filing windows for when you can start an LPFM station. The first one was in 2000, and uh, it was it had to fit into the, into the FM broadcast channels just like any other operate uh, just like any other radio station. And given channel congestion in the FM band, that left it rural. And in the 2000 window, most of the stations were gotten by. Uh, religious organizations in rural areas where none of the programming was locally originated. It all came from a satellite or over the internet. So it really didn't hit the community aspect of LPFM. So in the 2013 filing window, they changed it up a little bit. Uh, you could get something called a second adjacent channel waiver, which means with what, what they want is between two broadcast radio stations, they want two clicks of the dial before you get to another radio station. With the second adjacent channel waiver, if there's like three clicks between you and there's that spot in the middle, you can grab that spot. And that's how we got our station. Um, now, it's essentially unprotected, which means that if you interfere with a broadcast radio station, uh, you have to change. You have to make changes to make it work. If a, broadcast, if a commercial broadcast radio station interferes with you, well, them to the brakes, my friend. I guess that's just what you get. And in our case, there's actually a translator not too far south from us on 95.3, and we're basically no precedence there, so we just kind of have to live with it. Um, and here's a weird thing. No pirates allowed, which is weird because the LPFM, the idea, the concept, the lobbying for it was done in response to the clandestine radio stations of the 80s and 90s. It was a direct response to that because LPFM, or pirate radio stations, were getting lost people found. We're serving the community. We're doing things that commercial radio stations were not doing in the markets that they served. So they started, so they lobbied for the LPFM system, it got accepted, and then the people who were doing this work were suddenly not allowed to be a part of it. That was pretty lame. So let's look at a couple radio stations. This is a radio station from the 2000 filing. Uh, this is KOWWLP in Burlington, North Dakota. Population 1,291. Uh, their construction permit, which is, you now have permission to build a radio station, was granted in 2003. Their license to cover, which is, you are now a radio station, was granted in 2005. Also, it's the cow. I kind of like that, you know. Uh, I'd be on that station. Now there's this other station I happened. Oh, and then most importantly, uh, you can see here on the map that the entirety of Burlington, North Dakota is in that one millivolt per meter contour. Like the whole town. So they can reach their whole town. And then here is a plot from Radio Locator of all the stations that you're going to be able to hear on the dial. It's not that congested. It's, uh, it's pretty free comparative compared to a radio station from the 2013 filing window, which is a radio station I'm well familiar with. Uh, this is in Tacoma, Washington, population 219,205. It's an order of magnitude, nope, sorry, two orders of magnitude larger than the other population in the other station. Uh, our construction permit was granted in 2014. We filed our license to cover in 2017, and it looks very familiar here. Uh, first things first, you can see the, uh, the band's a little busier in Tacoma, Washington. It took some doing to find a place to fit. And then the other thing is, this whole thing is the town, and our contour does not cover the whole town. Like, we're a Tacoma, Washington radio station, but we're really a hilltop neighborhood radio station. That's, why we, that's how we identify ourselves. We're from the top of the hilltop, KTQA, LP, 95.3. So, <clears throat> I get that water now, actually. 
Yeah. <laughs> Throat gets sticky. So yeah, we we played uh, OTR for about five years because we kind of did it backwards. Usually you get a studio going and get your people together, but we were nerds and we really focused on the transmitter. So we worked on the transmitter chain first, and once we got that going, we started working on the studio. And that studio, we finally got the space and it coincided with 2021. I had to build a studio with my friends when you're no longer allowed to have friends anymore. It was, it was pretty tough. Um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the usual channels I do for getting my hands on hardware and equipment were closed to me because I couldn't really be in contact with a lot of my friends. I had to do it essentially uh, alone, but with advice and stuff like that <laughs> over the internet. There were a couple people who were able to help me out, but it was a very limited build out. So I had to, I had to think very carefully. And so I sat down and I came up with a bunch of guidelines Guidelines I think you'll all be pretty familiar with. Uh, I'll go through them very quickly. Don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, use hardware that already exists if it does the job well and you've got it. Unless it doesn't, uh, you know, that's a fairly straight one. But then, unless the wheel is square. Now, that has a lot of, you know, that, that, that has fairly clear in, uh, applications in software. But in hardware, for example, I have an absolute ton of tube preamps. 12 AX7s, 12 AU7s, different power configurations. Some they have solid state power, some have tube power. Um, am I going to use them in my radio station? No. Because tubes burn out. Tubes, I mean, why do they burn out? You know, they, they have a warmer sound. What is that warmer sound? Noise. I don't want noise in my chain. I use, uh, tr I use transistorized mic preamps and transistorized effects racks. Um, sunk time isn't. It's a, it's, a, it's a corner case of sunk cost is, you know, I have this project and I really want to work and this project is a linchpin of everything that I want to do and it must go. This is why I'm spent 80 hours in the last 72 hours on it. Nope, sometimes you got to let it go and move on. Uh, be cheap and good of the good, cheap, and fast thing. But be willing to spend extra money to learn something. Like when we were working on... Uh, trying to record it for the YouTube channel, I spent way more money than I needed to on, on camera mounting equipment because I'd never done it before and I learned a lot doing it. Uh, I spent a lot of extra money on cabling because I had some projects on cabling I wanted to try. I mean, we've got a budget of half a shoestring and like a Pringles can, but it's worth to spend maybe a couple extra inches of that Pringles can if you learn something out of it. It's community radio. Education is part of the game, even if it's education for you. Uh, favor UCs over Debbies. That, that's basically like, uh, don't fix it in post. Like, fix it now so that if you have to use your hardware or software in a place you didn't expect later, you're not having to like rebuild like the really weird structures. It's not actually about UI because most of the software and hardware that you're using in, in a broadcast chain, the operator never actually sees. <coughs> um, <coughs> favor domain inertia. This is an important one. Um, usually it means don't make everything web-based just because you expect things to be web-based in the software world. But in har the hardware world, it was especially important because we have an analog studio, but a digital studio link. Our link between the studio, the STL is what it's called, the studio to transmitter link. That link is digital. Uh, funny, I'll tell you about it later. Um, but so, what this means in this case is that if you're in the analog world, fix problems using analog technology. And then make the conversion once, and once you're in the digital world, fix problems using digital technology. Stay in the lane that you're in when you encounter problems. And then, <clears throat> basic, the last one is use Unix philosophy. Uh, the difference between a workshop with tools and the tools uh, do, multiple, do one thing and do it well, but they can be configured in different uh, in different configurations. And then the other one, which is like the car factory model, which is a, which is a machine that eats car parts and poops cars. Um, because our budget is so low, we needed problems to be transparent to us. And so having multiple 
relatively simplistic systems in a system that you can see the system or visualize the system worked well for us in developing the studio under our budget. So that's, that's the design thing. So let's talk about what building actually looked like. Uh, this is the broadcast desk. Uh, this is where, where the action happened. It's before it's completely populated. It's big, it's heavy. It's mostly empty space because uh, it's designed to hide, to hide like hundreds of pounds of wiring because everything is wired to literally everything else. And so the desk is completely designed to hide it all. You've got a couple racks in there. Uh, you know, the, the 19 inch data racks or audio racks, depending on who, you know, how you feel. Uh, we need, obviously needed to have whiteboards everywhere, but rather than buying whiteboards, because my usual, <coughs> my usual source for whiteboards uh, you know, wasn't available because COVID, um, we went with white hardboard from Home Depot. That means it's technically a wet erase board, but it still works. Like, you know, we just have to keep uh, isopropyl around. Uh, this, is my, uh, this is my office. Um, on one side, I have my desk and my, my file cabinet because when you run a radio station, you have files now. You have lots of files. You have to keep them. That's annoying. But then on the other side is the much more fun part, the electronics repair bay. So that, you know, because when you run a radio station, you're also doing repairs, especially if you're using uh, a lot of older equipment. Recapping all day, recapping forever, recapping until you die, recapping until the sun burns out, recapping until the sentence ends. You know, uh, I've learned how to replace uh, through holes or you know, put the rivets in through holes and swage it closed because uh, I did that a lot. <laughs> that was a learning experience. Um, this is our fridge. Uh, I'd like to talk to that refrigerator guy because uh, this thing would really rather be a Dodge Neon or a uh, lawnmower because it's loud and you hear it and it's not so great for a radio station. Uh, here's a fun one. So there's this little cave here right next to the whiteboards. And uh, see that thing up there, the, the little box uh, towards the top, the little cutout of the wall? That's the light switch for the whole studio. You have to go into this little cave and turn on the light switch. And it was just weird. And we wanted to use that for storage, but then you'd need like weird switching. So we just went with Panduit and, and moved the light switch out without cutting the breaker because in our studio space, we don't have access to the breaker. That was an adventure. And then here's the bathroom. Funny thing about the bathroom, you're in the studio. You're actually, this picture is taken from where guest three sits. And it has an exhaust fan, and it wasn't wired in. Now, we had to do something about it, because I think leaving that alone violated the Geneva Conventions and biological warfare. So, uh, so it had a plug, but it was unplugged, and we looked everywhere in the wiring. There was no switch for it. There was no way to control it. So eventually, we just put in a pull chain. <laughs> and that solved it. So we have the studio. We have the furniture. We're ready to go. So this was about trash. What sort of garbage did you use to build the radio station? Well, first things first, like CDs might be considered pretty old tech at this point, because well, they are. Um, there's still a major method of interchange for music on the local scene because CDs are inexpensive and uh, they're easy to produce. So we absolutely see needed a CD player. Now this is a circumstance where using, uh, where, where I favored learning <laughs> over cost is I went through a lot of CD players. And I eventually settled on, uh, they all needed belts or something, and getting the belts was going to be kind of difficult, and belts were not something I was really facile with yet. Uh, some of them were DVD players, and that added a whole layer of expense. And then I found this one. This is one I actually literally pulled out of a dumpster. Uh, it's an American DJ. It's sort of low end, but it allows you to select for samples. I just had to pop it open and, and you know make all the RCA connectors and all the audio and power connectors, make sure they were solid. Good to go, works in the studio. Another one is a vinyl player, because yeah, because you absolutely, absolutely need vinyl, because vinyl is so important to audio, even though any aspect you would get out of vinyl players are gonna be completely wiped out by the modulation ev uh, envelope of FM radio, but whatever, you know, vinyl's vinyl, it's cool. I'm, I'm just as guilty. Funny thing about this is that this is an MCS 6603 direct drive, turn direct drive turntable. Now you probably told belt driven is better, uh, at home it is, you know, in, in the broadcast studio you want direct drive because one, you can, you can, 
you, you can spin it if you scratch it if you need to, and also DJ Smash is a thing. So you want something that's pretty durable. Um, this is, funnily enough, if you, if you watch Techmoan, you might be kind of familiar with this. MCS is a JCPenney's era house brand uh, from the 70s, and what they would do is they would buy uh, Japanese equipment and just put it in its own in their own enclosures and this looks like something that you would buy from JC Penney's but on the inside it's a Technics SLQ2 it's actually a fairly it's a really solid turntable It was actually in Technics livery it would be worth maybe ten times what I paid for it nah, five times what I paid for it um, it's you know kind of related to the SL 1200 which is a turntable everybody uses uh, I actually I saw this and I was playing with it and I'm like are you sure you want to sell this to me? You could probably sell this. And like, yeah, no, I know what it is. You know, use it on the radio station. Friendship. It was pretty good. And then, obviously, uh, computers everywhere. Uh, there was a, a nearby um, real estate appraisal company that was closing up. Or no, they weren't closing up. They were moving to no office. So they were transitioning to laptops. They had a bunch of workstations they didn't need. Hey, do you want computers? Yes, I want computers. I need many computers. Also, do you want IP phones? Yeah, yeah, IP phones are great. These Cisco phones actually work pretty good in the studio because of the, uh, uh, of the headset, where normally you have to get like a 1U thing, and you know, yeah, specifically get a phone patch. I was actually, I was actually just able to use the, uh, the headset port here, and then just to make a, make a converter for it and put it into an unbalanced to balanced audio box, uh, like a DRV-134, if you want and do the job, and that gets it into the studio great. Um, and then finally, this is the one that we kind of lucked out on, is that there was a merger of two major broadcasting organizations, commercial broadcasters, where they were combining their efforts uh, into a single studio. They were basically going from the old one into the new one, and they said, well, this is all going in the trash. Would you like it? Yeah, yeah, I would definitely like it. And we actually got a lot of really good equipment. Like, we have a top-of-the-line broadcast studio if you were in 1995. I mean, it's really nice. It is super, like, we cleaned up the pots and, and everything, and it worked really well, but the thing is, it kind of had to sit in my house for three years before we found a studio. Ah, dusting was a pain. <laughs> so we have all the equipment. Now, you could totally build a studio without professional equipment. Uh, my previous studio used uh, um, just a Behringer USB interface and some touch screens as a mixer. So it's like, you don't need that stuff, but if you got it, hey, why not use it? But underneath that broadcast desk, so you got to wire it all together, right? Now, <clears throat> as a system administrator or somebody who works in, in like data rooms and stuff like that, I, I'm familiar with the DMARC which is the point where if it's on this side of it, it's the phone company's problem, and if it's on this side of it, it's now my problem. So, I mean, there were wiring boards with punch downs in the broadcast desk. There's no demarcation. If it's on this side, it's my problem. If it's on that side, it's my problem. But it's so stuck in my head, I call it the demark anyway. And there's three of them in the board. And yeah, like there's, there's specific punch down tools and uh, all, all the old networking equipment of yore comes to the fore when using this kind of equipment. And the thing is, is I didn't want to have to, like, contort myself into the, into the rack to do all the punching. So I made them all uh, removable. And so they've got special brackets. You can kind of see them in there uh, to remove them. I, I didn't do very well on the construction. I tried using a wood router, and it leaped out of my hand and landed in my, crouch, uh, my crotch. I got to... I got a pretty nasty scar, but I lucked out. I said, you know, I had sort of like, okay, if the blood reaches my ankle, I'm going to the emergency room. Never did. Just a flesh wound. Absolutely safe. Completely scared, but actually safe. <clears throat> so one other thing I did. Hang on. Thank you. All right. So another thing I did is, how do you wire it all up? Well... Usually, it's, you go from one punch block to the other with, like, Belden instrumentation cable, and there's hundreds of runs, and, and it takes a long time, and debugging it is a pain, and, well, I'm kind of lazy. And there's a guy, <clears throat> there's a guy Arthur, at, uh, Arthur Risotto at Freeform Portland, another LPFM station. When he built his studio, it's like, you know, I just use RJ45 and Cat5e everywhere for the wiring. 
Like, no, really? I was told that was terrible. Every time I saw a snake, it usually it was in this huge box, which suggested it have a bunch of passives in it or something like that. I'm like, no, it works fine. So I did. I tried it out. I went to a big box store. I bought some Keystone Jacks. Uh, I took a handful of XLRs and made a couple snakes. Uh, and, I, and I found like a 50, the most beat up junk, like 50 foot Cat5 run that I had. And I used that as the interconnect between the two ends of the snakes. Most lost I experienced is a third of a DB. Okay, I can live with that. That works. Um, yeah, we just use commodity Cat5. I'm able to run three balanced channels over one piece of Cat5 uh, using the brown pair as, as, the, as the shield. Now, if you're going to multiple pieces of equipment, like there are certain circumstances where you don't want a sh uh, shared shield, but given this was all inter, like intra-desk wiring, that was less of a problem. Um, <clears throat> in one run, I was actually able to carry two channels of balanced audio and 16 volt AC over one Cat5 AC run for the headphone amplifier between the guest desk and, um, uh, and, the, and, <clears throat> and the broadcast desk. And uh, so that's what that thing at the bottom is there. That LED is to make sure you get the, the two Cat5 pieces right. Because if you mix it, if you mix it wrong, uh, suddenly microphone two has 16 volts AC on it and that's not, it, it's not a condenser mic, it doesn't like that. It doesn't like that at all. And then another thing I use a lot of is, oh my god, I'm using Altoid tins everywhere. Altoid tins all day long. Um, this is actually building another snake uh, for Cat5e. And it does the run between the two computers that give us our VoIP interface and our digital media player so that it can run both to uh, the broadcast desk and our digital STL alone. And so we did a, a snake like that. So that's kind of, and there's a, there's a store in Tacoma called Tinkertopia, which is a, commu uh, a community or a reuse store. And it used to be that I'd have to buy Altoids and put them in a jar on my desk. And I like Altoids, but not really like Altoids. So they would just sit and stop being food and become ammunition. I mean, minty ammunition, but you know. Um, so that's kind of the junk we use. But there are certain things that are not trash uh, in the studio. There's times where you really gotta buy the right stuff. And one of the best ways to make sure that weird old mixer and those weird preamps and the weird wiring really sounds good is to make sure your inputs are as clean as possible. So one place I did not skimp was on microphones. I'm a big fan of Electro Voice. I have an RE20, makes my voice sound great. Uh, it's a broadcast classic. In our studio, we went with RE, uh, that's like a $700 microphone though, and that was definitely out of our budget. But uh, Electro Voice also makes an RE320, uh, which is kind of the same microphone, but, it, uh, but it's a little cheaper, it's more like an ND27, runs a little hotter. Um, so it's actually a little bit easier to work with and you can order them for about 200, or at least in 2021, uh, uh, you could order them for about 200 bucks all day. So they were the microphones to use. Uh, another thing that I, I did differently this time is I did an old IKEA hack. This is my old home studio. This is now my bedroom, uh, bedded not in evidence. Is uh, those articulating microphone stands are IKEA lamps. I just replaced the uh, the springs with heavier springs. Uh, JB welded some stuff onto them, zip tied some uh, instrumentation cable on it. Articulating microphone stands. When I did this in 2014, articulating microphone stands were 150 bucks. Like, no, I'm not going to spend that. Lamps are 10 bucks at IKEA. I have, I have 35 bucks of parts on it. Stand. But thanks to streamers and YouTube and everything, uh, microphone stands are cheap now. Uh, we bought them for 50 bucks and they work fantastic. So there's no need to skimp there. Another thing that I wouldn't skimp on before, like you can see it in this picture, this sort of bag of this clout nimbus of uh, coffee bags. So this is our sound treatment. This is rock wool insulation wrapped in burlap, sort of corseted in the back, my friend Sharon did that, and stapled to the wall. Works great. Uh, for the first 48 hours, it's pretty dusty, so you want to run some precipitators or something. But if you don't, if you don't touch it, it's not bad. Um, Works really well, but when I built it, uh, our Alex, the, the, the open cell foam you use for sound treatment, was like five or six bucks a square foot. It was really expensive. But again, thanks to streamers 
and uh, you know, online content producers, that stuff is like a buck a square foot now. So if I were doing this again, I'd just buy that. There's no reason to skimp on that. All right, so that's the hardware. Uh, let's talk about the software. Um, I'm an Arch Linux user. I know the kind of reputation we get, but in my case, it's uh, I'm such an old guy that I'm going to use a really old uh, reference to explain it. Like I'm like caveman lawyer when it comes to system administration. Like, what is this thing that it does? For me, it's less than I want to handle it myself, and, and more that I just get confused when it tries to help. So it's like. Stop helping me, which actually could be the motto of Arch Linux. Arch Linux, stop helping me. Um, obviously, we're using Jack, which is a low latency audio server for Linux. Uh, we're, we're actually, by the way, we're trying to do open source everything. If it doesn't exist, we're writing it. Um, you know, uh, Jack is, Jack now has a competitor with Pipewire. I don't know if it's a competitor, but like an alternative implementation that we're looking at. But for right now, Jack seems to be a bit more stable. Uh, remember when I talked about the STL between the studio and the transmitter? We're using Mumble for that. <laughs> um, so it's like we're using the same stuff Minecraft players use to talk to each other while they're playing. And it actually works really good. The Opus codec is fantastic. Um, CAF Studio Audio Gear, a little less known. It's a very good effects rack. Uh, specifically, it has a multi-band compressor, which is really good for fitting audio into, into your 75 kilohertz of deviation for FM. Um, uh, Audacity, of course. FFmpeg is a tool that I use. Like when somebody hands me weird audio, I can put it into uh, some format that people better understand. Uh, we use it for talking to Icecast. We use it for talking in, in a bunch of places. Like it's just, it is absolutely the uh, Swiss Army knife that it's designed to be. And then um, uh, Audacity, of course. And then Jack Capture for capturing audio. AJ Snapshot for managing my sessions. And Silent Jack for dead air detection. The FCC hates dead air. They don't want dead air. Uh, so we absolutely need that detector. So am I using SDRs? Oh boy, how do you am I using SDRs? We have four in our, in our transmitter rack. Uh, one to record, um, one to just record the radio station for logging purposes. This is Open WebRx, which we use kind of as a cheap and on-site uh, analyzer so we can see how the modulation is going. Uh, we have one that's agile so that we can listen around the band. And then one more for special things. I, I don't recall, actually. Uh, and then, so like I said, we did write some software. Uh, the one we use the most is probably System Jack, which is a interface between System D and all the audio apps we use. So they can run out of boot and do all this System D stuff. Uh, Caroline is our radio automation system. Back when we started the radio station, there weren't really good open source automation systems yet. And I needed one in about negative five minutes. So uh, I wrote one. It's embarrassing because I wrote it in PHP. You can smack me later. Or don't, that's creepy. Um, I, I really should learn Rust. I absolutely should learn Rust. But PHP is great if, if you just want C but don't want to deal with C you know, sometimes. Um, Jack WebPeak is a VU meter that uh, spits out uh, data over WebSockets. It's adapted from some folk code written by the guy who does X42 meters. Uh, Jack Minimix WebSocket. It's a, mix, it's a software mixer that operates over a WebSocket so we can control equipment via remote. Um, all the stuff that we're working on is available at link, github.com slash ktqa. Uh, and, that's, and that's it. That's, the studio was done. And first we were going to take leisurely time with it and, and sort of just make sure everything was work. But I, I actually ended up running into a bit of a hard deadline that I had to, that I had to meet in that during the process of building, uh, building the studio, uh, discovered I had a brain tumor. <laughs> uh, and suddenly, so it suddenly went like, ah, we can take our time with this. It doesn't have to be fast. We're, and, and it went to, oh, God, I have to have the studio running because next week I might have the brain power of a koala. And, it, you know, but <laughs> everything, obviously everything went right. Um, and here's uh, me <laughs> a week after my surgery. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not just completely screwing up mask protocol here. I'm not like the I'm, I'm not the opposite of the guy who just puts it over the, uh, over his mouth and leaves his nose going. That's actually called a mustache dressing, and it's designed to hold. Uh, yeah, that was weird. You know, I had a killer joke about this. I, I like I had a really great joke when I wrote this a month ago, and I can't for the life of me remember it. It's almost like there's something wrong with my brain. <laughs> So, 
you know, it goes on, and like, so here are these microphone stands, or sorry, not microphone stands, these speaker stands, these monitor stands. Um, they're great, they, they have great separation between the desk and, and the speakers themselves, so vibration isn't so bad, but you'll notice that they're kind of tall, and I don't think they were designed for that kind of speaker, and so that speaker tried to kill me one day, <laughs> it's a, it's timber, right on my head. So, and that, that's a, that's a heavy speaker. That, that, that can really knock you on your butt, especially if people have been digging around in your head recently. Um, so we replaced it with cinder blocks that we painted. Uh, and then, and this is one of my favorite things. You see that white ring in there on the monitor? The, the cone actually delaminated from the neoprene ring that lets it vibrate. And so we're like, oh crap, we're on a monitor now. You just, I need to go get another monitor, that's expensive. Uh, Becky, who you saw earlier, that was uh, my wife, Becky, and my cat, Ruth. You can figure out which one was which. Um, uh, just did some research and said, oh yeah, watered down white glue and toilet paper. You can reattach the cone to the neoprene ring. I was skeptical. But she did it, and it works great. And she's like, all right, now we can paint it, and nobody will know it was broken. And I thought about it. Leave it. <laughs> Let them know. Yeah, it worked real well. All right, so... That's the hardware side, but there's one more hack involved in this station, and that's managing volunteer organizations. Oh, God. Oh. Uh, I've been involved in the volunteer space for a long time, um, and there's two problems with volunteer organizations <coughs> that I experienced full-throatedly. <coughs> one was gatekeeping, where people had their their areas of influence, and you had to navigate the areas of influence to get things done. And the other was the albatross, where you are important to the, the volunteer organization, so they're going to give you a board position and a bunch of titles. They're not going to pay you, but now you're responsible for everything, and everything will die if you don't do the thing for the volunteer organization. I didn't want to do that. <clears throat> so we did it a little differently. We have a minimal board, three people, only existential things. Are we on fire? Are we being sued? Do we need to do filing? That's the, and that's the only thing that the board does. We, we meet once a year. All of the decisions are pushed into the committees. And I even changed the committee structure a little bit. We have three standing committees, and they're divided in ways that may not be obvious at first glance. There is the interaction committee, which is any time the radio station talks to anybody else and expects a response, an interaction, a full interaction. So that's finance, because money is an interac interaction. PR, that's an interaction. Marketing, that's an interaction. Records are an interaction because people will be looking at your records if you're a radio station. So that's definitely interaction. Production is, is the making the donuts. That's, that's the one you, for a radio station, that's when a conversation goes one way, and no real return is, is expected because it's broadcasting. So that's training, show production, scheduling, things like that. And then third is the construction committee, which is everything that if it hits you on the head hurts, which you might expect, which you might expect I have some experience with now. Um, that's the studio infrastructure, networking and streaming, the RF chain, archiving, plumbing, both network and literal plumbing. We've had to do that. Now you think I'd be, as the chief engineer of the station, that I would be in charge of the radio state of, of that committee. I'm not. I needed somebody in charge of me. That's Tim. I'm also, the, I'm also the station manager, so it's this weird interleaving power structure that makes no sense, but it works for us. I like it. So what are we up to in the future? Well, we're going to be war driving FM, believe it or not, because the rule of thumb is that in community radio stations, you know, the wider your band, the wider bandwidth you are, the less your range. So the rule of thumb is go mono, best range. That makes sense for radio stations in rural areas. I am not so certain it makes sense for a radio station like ours. Like, we are co-channel. We are on the same channel as a radio station 35 miles to the south that is so venerable, it has a three-letter call sign. And so I'm thinking we lose capture effect before our, we hit maximum range because of co-channel interference. I can do some math. Or I can buy more RTS, RTL SDRs, put them on cars, and drive around a bit, and actually just do sampling that way, actually test it in the field, which is what we're going to do. Uh, another thing that we're doing is we have no on-air lights, we have no, uh, we have no cues, it's actually fairly, uh, 
manual in the studio. The usual solution to that is to run uh, instrumentation uh, uh, wiring everywhere, use the GPIOs, wire them directly to like relay boards. That seems like a lot of work. Why don't I just use some IoT magic and jam it into an MQTT server and do everything that way? That seems a lot easier. Then the on-air lights could just have an ESP8266 in it that just subscribes to the on-air channel and, and gets, gets that way. And then I could put on-air lights in my house if I wanted to. I could put them anywhere. But then that opens up something else. If we go to stereo and I have MQTT and I'm using, which is something we definitely want to do, RDSS, which is the radio tech service, where it tells you what station and what's playing on your, on your equipment, Another thing it does that's important for, uh, L for LPFMs is if you go out of range, modern radios have a streaming link that'll just switch to the streaming link, which is pretty cool. It's not in a lot of radios yet, but I think it's coming. But the thing is, there's a page in the RDSS spec for just, you know, production data for the radio station. So what if I jammed MQTT frames into the RDSS stream of the radio station? Then I can get information about, like, I can get, you know, telema telematics about the radio station without an internet connection, which, like, you think, well, I mean, don't you always have an internet connection? We actually had an outage the day before we came out here. And so, <clears throat> like, I thought it was just going to be for fun, but, like, the utility became strangely apparent uh, right before we came out here. So the other thing, <clears throat> the other thing, that CD player, what I'm running into and what a lot of radio stations are running into right now is that CD players break a lot. They're really fragile, especially, uh, especially audio CD players. So we're going to build one that uses a SATA optical drive. So when the drive goes bad, you just pull it out, slap in another one. Uh, probably some sort of SBC with a good D to A uh, that can speak AES67 or balanced audio or whatever you like. It's an ongoing project. We're actually working with some other radio stations on that project. We're just getting started on it. Yet another reason to learn Rust. <clears throat> so why am I telling you about all this? What was all this about? This was fun. See, I had so much, this is my dream, this is something I've always wanted to do, but community radio, I'm discovering that, you know, that there's not a lot of hackers in community radio, that broadcast engineering is a very, one, it's venerable, broadcast engineering has like been around for 100, over 100 years, uh, but for, for such an old job, there, there's a lot of room for hacking, there's a lot of room for innovation, the community development that we do in, in, in this space, broadcast engineering, especially in community radio where budgets are so small, like everyone stands to gain if we could work together on this. Every, like there's so much fun stuff that could happen here. So I'm inviting you, one sec, I'm inviting you to go out and find one. There's LPFMs all over the country. Uh, Go find one. Or, even better, there's a window coming up. Start your own. I want to hear a hacker radio station. I, I couldn't do it. I'd like to see somebody win. Please, go forth. Find a radio station to work with. Bring the ethos that makes us what we are to community radio. Or start one yourself. I implore you, go forth. Do better than I did. Injure yourself less than I did. <laughs> All right? And so, if you'd like more information, Here's a, a link I've got, uh, how to contact me, a copy of the slides, um, organizations you can get in contact with. Uh, sorry that this was so US-centric, but it's an FCC thing. Actually, Community FM is way easier in, in New Zealand. They've got a general user's radio license, or a girl. Uh, yeah, so that's my talk. Thank you for coming by. Thank you for listening. I will be around for questions. Uh, how much time do we have? Oh, wow. All right. Kind of blew through that then. Jeez. <laughs> so thank you.